So welcome. welcome everyone to our International Women's Day Convergence, Calls for Action to End the Era of Fossil Fuels and Accelerated Just Transition. My name is Osprey Oriel Lake and I am the Executive Director of the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network. Um, and we're just so glad that you all could take this time with us today um, to celebrate International Women's Day. Um, and as we start, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge this very challenging time for many people and welcome you all to a space for us to be together from all over the world. There's, there's uh, people tuning in from, from, from many different countries right now, and we welcome all of you. And I want us all just to take a breath and be grounded together in the earth under our feet, wherever we are, and to look up at the sky and to see the sun or the clouds or the rain or wherever you are, what the weather is like. Um, and just to acknowledge that we're on this beautiful living planet. During this convergence today, we're bringing together global women leaders and all their diversity to share the many ways they are working to strategize and build the solutions needed for an equitable and just transition, which also includes food sovereignty, gender responsive climate policies, regenerative economics, forest protection, indigenous rights, rights of nature, demilitarization, phasing out fossil fuels, and so much more. These are areas that um, I'm so thrilled that our movement is engaged in. The temperature is rising and so are we, and we need to continue to grow and build our movements. And I wanted to just to share a few uh, comments, and then we're gonna hear from incredible leaders on two different panels. Um, and I'm just so honored that uh, these amazing leaders have joined us today and really glad that we will be able to have their voices be heard uh, in our community. International Women's Day has its roots in the early 20th century, emerging amidst a global tide of feminist activism and labor movements. And I wanted to remember that today. The inaugural celebration took place in 1911, inspired by the voices of women advocating for better working conditions, suffrage rights, and gender equality. Spearheaded by socialists and suffragettes, International Women's Day gained momentum, spreading across continents as a rallying cry for justice, and has evolved into a global platform for advocating gender equality and celebrating the contributions of women in all their diversity in all spheres of life. It's a time to amplify the voices of marginalized women address systemic inequalities, and push for feminists' agenda worldwide. This also means we do not turn away from the horrific violence and injustices of women and communities in Gaza and Israel, Ukraine, Sudan, the DR Congo, and other regions. Our struggles for justice, equity, well-being for people and planet are interlocking. And we join global calls for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza and safe return of all hostages. There is no climate justice without human rights. And International Women's Day is a time for us to call for justice, equity, and dignity for everyone and express solidarity among women across different cultures, backgrounds, and experiences. And specifically regarding the climate crisis, we are at a choice point for humanity and with no significant action, the crisis will continue to escalate. And yet we know solutions exist that can mitigate the worst impacts and that women and feminists are leading the way. And I just wanted to share, you know, one stat because people are always asking me about, you know, how do we show that women are leading the way? So I, there's so many uh, ways that we could express it, but just one uh, data point that I think is really powerful uh, that shows that just a one unit increase in a country score on the women's political Empowerment Index, which is really showing how women are engaged in politics or in social movements or what is their agency in their country or communities. Um, with just a one unit increase, we see an 11.51% decrease in the country's carbon emissions. And it's not all about reducing carbon emissions, but it's significant to see what happens when women are leading. Other research has repeatedly shown that actively involving women in management and decision-making surrounding local forests, water and disaster planning and response leads to more successful programs and projects. So whether it's on the front lines of resistance to fossil fuels, protecting and replanting forests, creating food sovereignty networks or advocating for bold and transformative climate policies at international forums, women are critical 
to the trajectory that we want to see for our communities. It's code red for humanity, and we are drawing a red line to say no more sacrifice people and no more sacrifice zones. We need to move forward with a climate justice framework, and this is the time to unite together to build a healthy and just future we know is possible for each other and the earth. And on every continent, women land defenders are rising, and in some cases, literally putting their bodies and lives on the line to protect Mother Earth, our communities, and all that we hold dear. And today I want to honor women and two spirit land defenders and bring light to the struggles and solutions of so many courageous leaders. And, and to say that there is a historical connection to the violence against women and the violence against Mother Earth that we can't afford to ignore and that must be healed and is at the deep root of so many of our interlocking crises. And I ask you to join me in celebrating and standing in solidarity with women around the world rising as caretakers and as protectors and defenders of our precious planet and communities. It's critical to radically imagine a world that we know is possible and create and fight for that future. And I say this because as, there, as there's just so much instability in the current systems and as they falter, it's actually time where new ways of thinking, visioning, and being can have a considerable impact. Even ideas and policies that seemed too radical before can take hold in these moments when there's cracks. And importantly, the pressure and insight of global people's movements are central to pushing forward transformative and bold leadership right now because we don't yet have the politics in place to tackle our multiple interlocking crises. So we need to draw upon the knowledge and leadership of indigenous black and brown women, gender diverse leaders, feminist and global women leaders who are already deeply engaged in solutions. These are the ones, these are the people that we need to be looking to to lead us forward. Our call to action for gender justice, racial justice, upholding indigenous rights and rights of nature, calling for a just transition and immediately phasing out fossil fuels is an ongoing agenda for people and planet. In fact, it's an urgent call for our very survival. And so that's why we're gathering today to really lift up the voices that have been marginalized and who are also critical to the solutions that we need right now. And with that, I would like to welcome um, our first panel, which is focused primarily on ending fossil fuels and a feminist agenda and analysis concerning this. And I'm so thrilled to have with us um, this amazing group of leaders. And I'm gonna go ahead and introduce them um, in the order that they're gonna be speaking. And then we're gonna hear a presentation from all of them and have a discussion. So first we're gonna be hearing from President Whitney Gravel of the Bay Mills Indian Community. She's president and executive council Bay Mills, uh, president and executive council Bay Mills Indian Community from Turtle Island or the USA. Uh, then we're gonna be hearing from Dipti Batnagar from the World Commission on Fossil Fuel Phaseout from Mozambique. And then we'll be hearing from Dr. Crystal Cavalier, who is Okanichi Band of the Saponi Nation. She's co-founder of Seven Directions of Service from Turtle Island, USA. And then we will be hearing from Ruth Nyambura. She's from the African Ecofeminist Collective from Kenya. And then finally, we'll be hearing from Mitzi Janelle Tan, she is a convener and international spokesperson for Youth Advocates for Climate Action Philippines from the Philippines. And with that, I'm so honored to have you start us off, President Whitney Gravel. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Osprey, Ani Buju, Giwaden Nagabo Kwain Dishnakaz, Ganushnakani Nindonjaba. My name is the woman who stands in the north. My English name is Whitney Gravel, and I'm going to share a presentation today. Uh, regarding the Line 5 dual pipelines, uh, which is an active fossil fuel battle that my community, as well as many other tribal nations in the Great Lakes, are currently going through. Uh, one of the unique aspects of the Line 5 dual pipelines is that it is not so much and necessarily about how are we preventing future pipelines from being built, but rather a conversation about what do we do with the old and aging fossil fuel infrastructure that has already caused so much damage within our communities. The issue involving the Line 5 dual pipelines really began and was highlighted after the Kalamazoo River oil spill in 2010, whereby Line 6B 
ruptured and spilled more than 1.2 million gallons of crude petroleum product in the Kalamazoo River. And that was considered one of the largest inland oil spills by Enbridge Energy in the United States. And even now to this day, the communities that are near where Line 6B ruptured uh, are still not able to harvest or live off the land or drink the water nearby, despite uh, federal regulations and standards declaring that that area has been cleaned and remediated. After Line 6B ruptured, there were two questions uh, and somewhat of a collective awakening throughout the Great Lakes where folks started to ask themselves, you know, we have pipelines and then where are they located? Almost immediately after there was awareness and attention uh, brought to the Line 5 dual pipelines, which run all the way and connect to the Line 3 pipeline from Minnesota across the state of Wisconsin and through 645 miles through the state of Michigan connecting over into Sarnia, Ontario. Um, since Line 5 was first constructed in 1953, it has had more than 33 spills, resulting in a cumulative spill of 1.2 million gallons of crude product across the Great Lakes. And of those 33 different spills, only one of them had ever been documented or detected by leak detection mechanisms within the pipeline. As awareness around Line 5 began to grow, a lot of folks began to realize that Line 5 actually traversed through the Straits of Mackinac, which is a four mile waterway that connects both Lake Huron and Lake Michigan. And for those of you who have not been to the United States or have not visited the Great Lakes themselves, the Great Lakes, although we call them lakes, are really much like inland seas. And they are the largest freshwater body resource in North America and supply more than 20% of the world's surface freshwater uh, for all of us here on planet Earth. And so as Line 5 was starting to have attention brought to it, we realized that if a spill were to occur in the Straits of Mackinac, where these bodies of water connected, that more than 700 miles of shoreline would eventually become contam contaminated due to the currents and, and just the sheer power of the lakes where the line was actually running. As activism and involvement by tribal nations in the Great Lakes started to begin, what we realized was that there were significant failures of the line along it. Their protective coatings along the line five dual pipelines was wearing away. Originally, when it was built in the 1950s, it had seven different layers and based on different testing that had been completed, we realized that it was down to one in certain portions of the pipeline, which meant that it was extremely vulnerable to any type of damage and that if something were to happen, it would result in a catastrophic rupture. As these studies were being completed, we suffered a very unfortunate anchor strike in 2018, whereby the pipelines were hit by a overhead freighter and dragged several feet beneath the water in the Straits of Mackinac. And despite the concerns raised by tribal nations, we were told that it was a one in a million chance and it would never happen again. And then a secondary line strike, uh, anchor strike happened in 2020. And during that time, the pipeline was found to have been so critically damaged that it was shut down for 120 days while repairs were uh, implemented in order to make sure that it would not rupture or cause significant damage. So the question that we get, you know, especially in sharing statistics regarding the Line 5 dual pipelines is, why do tribes care? Why do they get involved? You know, what role do we play in making sure that we're leaving a better place for future generations? Well, my tribal nation, Bay Mills Indian Community, is a signatory to the 1836 Treaty of Washington. And in that treaty, we ceded 14 million acres of land and 13 million acres of water to the United States for the creation of the state of Michigan. And Michigan became a state in 1837. And if you look on the screen here, this black outline uh, traversing this territory is that treaty ceded territory. And treaty ceded territories have a very unique place uh, in federal law here in the United States, as well as within international law when we talk about human rights. Because although my ancestors at the time in negotiation of that treaty were willing to 
giveaway land and giveaway water, they carved out one of the most special things that they could have carved out, which was the usual privileges of occupancy. And the usual privileges of occupancy are really about being able to live an indigenous way of life within your territory and be able to continue your cultural practices associated with that. The treaties have been affirmed by federal law, but again, emphasize you know, the relationship and connection that we have with Turtle Island, that we have with both land and water. We understand in our teachings as Anishinaabe that in the line of creation, man and women were created last, not because we are the most important, but rather because we are the least important. And we rely on all that which came before us to be able to survive. And so the treaty right itself is intricately interwoven into many of the teachings that we have associated with our relationships with land and water. What does that mean to us as Anishinaabe? How do we live out those usual privileges of occupancy? And as you'll see demonstrated here, a lot of our creation stories are also associated with the Great Lakes. This is the place where Turtle Island was created. This is the birthplace of North America and the Great Lakes themselves are the heart of Turtle Island. And that too is really represented in not only the statistics that the Great Lakes have, being 20% of the world's surface fresh water, they provide drinking water to more than 40 million people in North America, but also in our teachings to understand that these aren't just lakes, it's not just water. If you were to create an equivalent, you know, for us, it's really like the Garden of Eden and should be treated and respected as such. So when we talk about indigenous lifeways and what that means and why we're combating the Line 5 uh, dual pipelines is ultimately we're trying to protect those sacred provisions that were outlined in that treaty, those usual privileges of occupancy, the ability and the right to go out to fish, hunt, and gather. And the treaty right to fish is so much more than the physical act of fishing because if you don't have a healthy ecosystem and you don't have clean water and you don't have a healthy environment, then there are no fish for you to exercise the treaty right to fish. And fish are not just there to also supply food for you to eat, but they're involved in your ceremony, they're involved in your teachings, and they're involved in your understanding of the world. And so when we look at the Line 5 dual pipelines, what we really start to see is that there are ongoing human rights violations in the Great Lakes. Uh, we have seen that the Human Rights Council has acknowledged that there is a right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment, that Indigenous peoples are entitled to free prior and informed consent, and that when projects are taking place within Indigenous communities' territories, they are meant to have direct and significant stakes and participation in the decisions involving those specific projects. Furthermore, when we talk about the right to culture or the right to family or the right to home life, what you start to see is that international human rights has enshrined the inalienable right for indigenous peoples to be able to enjoy their territory. And when that is being threatened by fossil fuel projects, it requires us to have a serious conversation about the rights afforded to indigenous peoples, whether it be under treaties, uh, treaties between the U.S. and Indigenous peoples, whether it be under international human rights law, and the obligations that come with those treaties, which means that we must protect the territories and the natural resources that Indigenous people like myself and my community rely upon in order to be able to live out our Indigenous way of life. And so all of this is to really come full circle to say that Countries really need to start taking special measures to protect the rights of Indigenous peoples and really take into consideration the disproportionate impacts that fossil fuel projects have on Indigenous communities. Because our lifeways are so much more interwoven into the physical environment, it means that we are much more sensitive to the changes and to the impacts that will happen from fossil fuel infrastructure, including uh, the devastating impacts of oil spills. And all of this to say that, you know, from the time of our ancestors to the time now and to the time seven generations into the future, 
we're all here together in order to be able to live in a harmonious way with the land, with the water, with Turtle Island, because we know that if we take care of her, she will also take care of us. And so um, with that, I'll go ahead and conclude my presentation uh, regarding the Line 5 dual pipelines. And if there are any questions, folks can uh, share those in the Q&A. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, President Whitney Gravel. Uh, really appreciate that beautiful presentation and also to say how important Indigenous women's leadership is to all of us. And thank you for your leadership and um, you know the wisdom that all of us need to really learn from um, as, in, uh, as we look towards how we're going to build an equitable and just future, how important it is for us to lift up Indigenous leadership. So thank you for, for all that you shared with us. And I also wanted to say that um, for those of you from the US, uh, but also it's good for our international audience to know that next week there's going to be um, a big rally in Washington DC to stop line five and then a special screening of a new film that's come out on Bad River um, that's gonna be premiered um, throughout the country that starts next week. And we really need to stop this pipeline as we do fossil fuel infrastructure all over the world. We cannot have any more fossil fuel extraction or expansion. And um, this is part of that ongoing struggle. So thank you so much. Um, and we will be standing with you all the way through this fight. Um, and now we'd love to hear from Dipti Bhatnagar. You have the floor, Dipti. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Osprey. Very grateful to be with all of you today. I just came from a Palestine solidarity and community healing space. I bring you that energy. And also it's, it's a stark reminder of just how deeply our collective humanity is being tested right now. And how are we going to react to it? How are we going to fight to reclaim our humanity is really important. I come to you from Mozambique and the Indian Ocean coast. You can see behind me the curtain flying all over the place. There's a storm coming. Actually, there's a tropical storm about to hit the center of the country of Mozambique, which is a town called Beira, which you may have heard was devastated by Cyclone Idai in 2019, was hit again by Cyclone Freddy last year in 2023. This is one of the countries most affected by the ravages of the climate crisis. My home, Mozambique is my home for the last almost 13 years. This is also the place where one of the largest gas fields found anywhere in the world in the last 10 years has been discovered. And our government is, along with the usual transnational corporations going as fast as they can to try and develop it. But also at the same time in Cabo Delgado in the north of Mozambique, the gas rush has provoked an insurgency and a state of conflict and militarization. And I don't need to tell all of you sisters and brothers on this call of how that affects women most deeply. But I wanted to speak to you today about a new initiative that I'm working on after a decade at Friends of the Earth International hosted by Justice Ambiental here in Mozambique, Friends of the Earth Mozambique, I'm now working on co-creating a World Commission on Fossil Fuel Phase Out. So what does that look like? This is the theme that we're talking about today. The World Commission on Fossil Fuel Phase Out starts from the position of not whether we need to phase out fossil fuels, but how do we do it? We need some mechanisms for identifying what are the barriers to the phase out and hence what are the remedies that we need to bring to the situation. But at the same time, it cannot be about whether we phase out, it's about how are we actually going to do it. So what are some of the barriers of the phase out? What are some of the barriers to the fossil fuel phase out? Movements fighting against fossil fuels, Movements on the ground, fighting for survival, like we've just heard from President Whitney as well, fighting for identity, fighting for recognition, fighting for their territories, are, are talking to us about a full, fair, fast, funded, feminist fossil fuel phase out. Lots of Fs. We love, we love our alliteration <laughs> in the movements, don't we? But what does that actually look like? A full, 
phase out of fossil fuels means no abatement, no plan B for the fossil fuel industry. They plan to use petrochemicals, they plan to use plastics, they plan to use carbon capture and storage, geoengineering and carbon offsets as the pressure cooker valve for them to continue polluting. We say no, no to abatement, no to a plan B and a continued life and profit for the fossil fuel industry. It is a barrier. This is a barrier to full phase out of fossil fuels. What does a fair phase out of fossil fuel looks like and what are the barriers to it? We need to be talking about equity and historical responsibility. We need to be talking about capacity of countries to be able to transition. The people of Mozambique, 70% do not have access to electricity. What phase out looks like and what a just transition looks like in this country is very different than it looks like in Saudi Arabia or in the US or in Norway. What is a country's dependence on fossil fuel revenues? These factors need to be taken into account when thinking about how, how what are the mechanics for a fossil fuel phase out? International trade agreements are a massive barrier to the fossil fuel phase out. The investor state dispute settlement is a space where companies can take governments to court because of their policies. Mozambique is one of the countries with the highest ISDS burdens in the world right now. One of the poorest countries in the world could be taken by total to court today saying that you are responsible, Mozambique, you are responsible for the insurgency and the lack of profits that we are making from your gas in Cabo Delgado and we will take you to court over it. What will happen to this country? What will happen to our meager education and health spending if $40 billion are going to be stolen by Total from this government, from this country? International trade agreements are a barrier to the fossil fuel phase out. The international financial architecture is a barrier to the fossil fuel phase out. When the country of Colombia starts to talk about wanting to go fossil free, a producer country like Colombia starts talking about wanting to go fossil free, you have the Moody's credit rating agency downgrading their credit rating, affecting their access to fiscal spending. Debt is a massive barrier to the fossil fuel phase out. How many countries in the global south are going after their fossil fuels, pulling them out of the ground because they say it's absolutely necessary for them to be able to address their debt burden? So what we are trying to do, friends, in the World Commission on Fossil Fuels is to put together an unlikely group of people, a new group of people. We need new people to be saying these things. We have been saying these things for a very long time. Some of us, many, many of you have been in this movement for a really long time. We need to look at in great detail the barriers to the fossil fuel phase out. We need to suggest remedies to those barriers, we need an, a, a group of people who's going to be committed to transforming themselves and each other in the bargain. We all have so much to learn from each other. How do we actually do it? These are the mechanisms. This is, the, this, this is what I'm trying to figure out in, in my new role. We also know that people who are proximate to power often drift and often have a phenomena of shifting goalposts. The crises that we are in are way too deep. The dehumanization that we're seeing across the world is way too deep. What Osprey just said about the sacrifice people, the sacrifice zones, it's too late to be able to drift and to be able to shift goalposts. The goalpost is very, very clear. We need to reclaim our humanity. We need to talk about how is the fossil fuel phase out going to happen? How are countries like Mozambique going to be able to give the most basic rights of energy and food and water and communication and belonging to their people? How are we going to do it? How are we going to connect our humanity, our need for belonging? How are we going to connect our Ubuntu? Which is, a, which is a term that comes from Southern Africa, from these lands, I am because we are. How do we see each other and connect with each other? 
and talk about how the fossil fuel phase out is going to happen. And at the same time, how are we going to connect to the earth and to transform ourselves and each other and to be able to reclaim our humanity and feel safe showing our humanity and showing our connection to the earth that President Whitney just talked about. This is what I'm working on today, tomorrow. I hope that we can be together along in this journey to see each other, to see each other's work and to continue to support each other on this day, on International Women's Day and every other day of the year. I thank you. Thank you for this space to speak with you. I'm very grateful to be here. Thank you so much, Dipti. Really inspiring. And thank you for your incredible work over years and years. You've been colleagues for years and years and years. And uh, I'm so excited to hear about your new initiative. It's really needed and really important. And um, just wanted to, to also reflect upon the wisdom of your words around the fact that it's way more complicated than I think many of us realize what this phase out really is going to entail so that it is just and equitable, that we don't leave people behind. No one can be left behind. Countries can't left behind. Marginalized communities can't be left behind. And we cannot make the transition look anything like what we've seen in terms of the extractive economy, because the same communities, indigenous, black and brown communities will suffer from the extraction of uh, all of the different mining that is you know, planned for the transition into um, the uh, uh, having batteries and, and moving us to electrical um, is, is obviously part of the solution. But how we do that is also very important. And I feel really embedded in your, com in your comments as well, that the phase out also has to include this very deep climate justice analysis so that we are all doing this together and evenly. And so um, I really thank you for your comments on that and excited to, to partner with you to support the efforts and to get into these actual mechanisms that are going to help us with the phase out. So thank you so much for your dedication and work. Um, and with that, I would like to uh, hand the floor now to Dr. Crystal Cavalier. You have the floor. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you. Thank you so much, We Can Osprey, for letting me be here and, and celebrate this International Women's Day with you. Mikudamin Chin Kiohe Nahal PP say, Mima Crystal, Mima Okanichi Saponi, Mima Mebin Watiwa. And Ashley, if you could share my slides, that would be a great help. Um, and I just want to thank Grandma Casey Camp, grandmother, uh, great grandmother Mary Lyons, and my auntie Beverly for um helping me shape who I am in my women's view today. And I want to talk about the Mountain Valley Pipeline, Southgate extension and the Mountain Valley Pipeline. I don't have much written on these slides because I wanted you guys to understand the effects this pipeline is, ha is having on my community. Um, and it's so important that we uplift women leaders in all communities across Turtle Island and around the world. And I have recently moved into working into international spaces to try to fight this pipeline as our rights here on the East Coast especially some of our tribal nations do not have treaties with the United States. Nine years after private companies set out to build this 303 fracked gas pipeline, the Mountain Valley Pipeline, and the now 41 mile pipeline, Southgate Extension coming through North Carolina, many of our mountains, rivers, and farmlands have been targeted. This project is billions of dollars over budget and years behind schedule. Moreover, experts, have highlighted evidence that this project has no economic need for the benefit. And since then, uh, many fossil fuel companies and um, utilities have been brought into this so they can show this economic need. But this was after they started the pipeline. Because of how pat patriarchal my state is here in North Carolina, women are holding positions in which men allow them to hold meaning they're being held back. Other women who are not popular are attacked and we must stop this harm, raising this voice on International Women's Day. As an indigenous people, we relate to the land and nature and most of our two-legged relatives here on the East Coast have, do not understand that. 
they have forgotten that original teaching by the creator. And as an indigenous woman in the last six years during this movement, I faced intimidation by leaders and indigenous leaders who have power in local, federal, and state tribal agencies who do not understand the human rights violations that is happening with this pipeline. And I, on my, on my journey, you know, I try to prep how I debate people. And I read this book, uh, The Art of Being Right. And a quote stuck with me. A last trick is to become personal, insulting, rude. And as soon as you're, you perceive that your opponent has the upper hand, that you're going to come off worst, it consists in passing from the subject of dispute as from a lost gain to the disputant himself in some way attacking this person. In the Again, in the last nine years, five or more indigenous water protectors and land defenders have been arrested for protecting these sacred sites that the MVP is desecrating. So you can see here, this is one of the sacred burial mounds that is on the mountains in Virginia. And there was a letter, a three-page document, and a 60-page report from organizations that have alleged that the Mountain Valley Pipeline has violated these human rights for nearly a decade. We um, use the principles of the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People of Articles 11, 26, and 29. We wrote to the Special Rapporteur for Indigenous Peoples for the United Nations to talk about the violations of indigenous people who reside on Monacan, Saponi, and Okanichi lands that are historical and current, that we have a right to preserve and transmit our culture and protect our sacred sites and artifacts. Although the company is publicly stating the project is substantially complete, in a recent report in January, it was only 63% complete. We have reached out to FERC and many other organizations to try to help stop this. Um, the Mountain Valley Pipeline is all, they keep saying it's almost done and it deserves an extension or it has too many hurdles to complete. The project should go back to the drawing board. Both cannot be true. Perhaps one reason why MVP is asking for so much time is that it knows this, this project is hardly complete. Again, we requested this review with the United Nations because we felt that these Human rights violations needed an international lens. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So since FERC issued an MVP certificate in 2017, additional evidence has emerged showing that the pipeline is not needed. Following failing renewable energy prices, a growing body of evidence and that the developers overstated that the demand for gas and upgrades to existing infrastructure show that increased available capacity substantiates the lack of market need for the MVP. So this pipeline is not needed. Again, states such as Virginia and North Carolina have adopted clean new energy policies, leading utilities to scrap plans for new gas fire power plants. And MVP's leading anchor shipper, EQT, has publicly stated that it no longer has a need for the pipeline's capacity. So you can see here on this slide, that the Mountain Valley Pipeline is going through sharp, steep terrain through West Virginia, Virginia. And then when it turns to this dotted line, that is where the MVP Southgate will come through. Now, we were successful in getting this pipeline out of Alamance County, but now it is attacking a sacred site in Rockingham County, Fort Lower Sarratown. And in the last few months, MVP has breached a karst aquifer near Sinking Creek. A torrent of polluted water has flooded nearby properties, choking Sinking Creek with thick, muddy discharges, and numerous other streams have suffered mm -hmm. repeated runoffs of pollution caused by the MVP. These incidents My have pleasure. occurred in, in late 2023 mm -hmm. and are continuing to 2024. So in conclusion, I want to thank you so much for allowing me to speak about this. This is our sacred corn, the Tudelo strawberry corn. And I really appreciate this platform. And I do agree with President Gravel as indigenous people and us here at Seven Directions to Surface, we are working to educate communities to help understand how our severed connections to the land and the natural world affects us as human beings. Alewa.
Thank you so much, Crystal, for that amazing presentation and your incredible work to fight the Mountain Valley Pipeline. Um, it's been just such um, uh, an emotional roller coaster, I will say, over the last you know ten years. That fight's been going on for a decade, and in the last uh, year, particularly incredibly difficult. And um, I I just so deeply respect how much uh, your community has fought. And also to say that, um, you know, this is where the struggle really shows itself because this was a political move to put Mountain Valley Pipeline uh, up and running and give the permits to go through. And um, this is why I was saying earlier, we don't have the politics in place and we're gonna have to radicalize everything that we do to really take on this new paradigm, this new way of living, this transformation we're in. Um, so on the one hand, you know, we're in this perilous moment, but we're also in this moment of incredible promise and opportunity because we have to change everything about how we are living with the earth and each other. And it just shows again that, that we're fighting from the grassroots up and this is what we need to be doing. So thank you for your leadership. And with that, I would like to give a warm welcome to Ruth Nyambura. Please take the floor, Ruth. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much. There really isn't uh, a lot to add uh, given the beautiful presentations that we've just had. Um, but I want to start my presentation by going back. You know, Amilka Cabral talks about um, return to the source. Um, and again, as you as you had started, Osprey, as you had indicated, that this day, the 8th of March, which unfortunately has been taken over by liberal ideas of feminism, um, militarization, um, the corporatization of what feminism and radical women's power means, we have to return to what it has actually meant, solidarity. It has meant a dismantling of patriarchy. It has meant a dismantling of capitalism. It has meant a reimagining of our relationships with one another. But at the same time, given the political moment, it has meant, and it means rather, a solidarity with those going through a genocide in Gaza, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where all these beautiful phones and gadgets that we use um, is as a result of the wet and tears literally of the land and the people of the democratic is being the colonized people of Western Sahara, Papua New Guinea, uh, and those on Tattle Island and unceded Lembering, those of us who are in the global south continue to live the afterlives of colonization, neoliberal globalization. So just to return us to the source of what 8th March actually is in this particular moment. So my presentation really is two-pronged. Um, one, to think about we, you know, a conversation around what policy priority priority areas, and it's part of what Deepti had touched on um, in terms of when, when you talk about a just transition, you know, from fossil and making machine of capitalism and the Ruth, I'm so sorry you're breaking industries and off. as role in the care economy, uh, food, water, energy. Uh, uh, Ruth, you're breaking up a lot. You okay, might want to put your uh, video uh, off and maybe we can, can you hear me now. Yeah. Uh, okay, just, just one second. Uh, I will. Let's give Ruth a minute to see if it can come around. Okay, can I just give me one second? I'm going to change my switch my connection. Just one second. No worries. Oops, I hope we haven't lost her. 
I'll give it a few more seconds, and if not, we'll go to our next presentation, then come back to Ruth. Oh, my goodness. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Sorry, I had to change my connection. That's not, no worries. Yes, we can hear you really well right now. Thank you. All right, all right. Okay, my apologies for that. Um, no worries. So, okay. <laughs> Um, as I said, my presentation basically is, you know, speaking about, um, you know, for imagining worlds, what do they mean in concrete terms? So climate change is both a driver and multiplier of multiple and intersecting gendered inequalities. For African women and women in the global south specifically, our role in the care economy, food provision, water, and energy needs for the household, you know, continue, you know, to be mediated by patriarchal structures, um, which makes us very particularly susceptible to the climate crisis and the negative externalizing impacts of the extractive industries uh, that we can trace from colonialism, uh, neoliberal globalization, structural adjustment programs, and the attendant crisis related to that. A lot of the existing debates around um, just transition, you know, and the climate crisis tend, unfortunately, to follow one of several depoliticizing, opportunist, or even reformist analytical approaches. They take a, a, a reformist approach in the context of analysis and political programs, which refuse to consider that the world we live in the world that we live in is structured by, you know, a world spanning history of colonization and class struggle occurring in a divided world. This reforms, you know, continue to be attempts to politicize or rather depoliticize the climate and its attendant crisis, but only so far that it does not get to the heart of the matter so that we do not upset the status quo. Various technical blueprints, um, discussions, drawing boards, and a lot actually happening within multilateral spaces such as the United Nations and policy debates continue to foreclose conversations around climate debt, ecological debt and reparations, workers' rights, the changing nature of work, you know, and that speaks to the nuances of labor and especially also, you know, feminist ideas of liberation and transformation. So what does a just transition, you know, specifically, specifically entail for women? It would mean a systemic and structural change, not merely technical or technological solutions or the continued false solutions to the climate crisis in the form of carbon markets or geoengineering technologies, it would mean dismantling of patriarchy and the intersections or rather at the intersections of race, class, caste, legacies of colonialism, neoliberal globalization, the enclosures of the commons and other power asymmetries, which are mutually reinfor uh, reinforcing. It would mean a reimagining of the state. The state and other, of course, not just a reimagining of the state as we understand it, but also reimagining a politics of sovereignty, especially when we're talking about unceded land, indigenous peoples. Um, it also means a dismantling of the ideas of privatization. It is a, it is a logic of, of, this is a logic of commodification of the commons that brings us the extractive industries as we experience it. So it means that we have to think about, you know, um, the ways in which the intersections of the kinds of violence that we face, right? The violence that we have faced because of uh, fossil fuel extraction, it means that we have to think about the similar violence that we face whether it is the Sengwer indigenous people in the Cherangani Hills in Kenya being evicted from their ancestral lands because of carbon markets. It means that we have to think about the undocumented migrant workers from Latin America working in slave-like conditions in meat processing factories in the US. It would mean, you know, thinking about workers and especially living under the last four years of uh, you know, a health crisis, a COVID crisis, which everybody seems to think has disappeared, but still continues to be with us and really reveal the underbelly of, uh, of capitalism. It would mean you know, thinking through and organizing with movements across the world, such as uh, La Via Campesina, MST, Abalali Basim Jondolo in South Africa. It would mean a resistance um, to the status quo as is. It would mean transnational and transversal feminist organizing so that the contexts that unite us are real, not just the contexts that separate us, not just the capitalist extracting machine that continues to separate us. It would mean 
to that we need to think carefully about the possibilities of anti-imperialism, anti-capitalism, and decolonization beyond heap slogans, but by centering questions of land, for example, which remain so important for so many people, and especially indigenous peoples across the world, building power around the radical alternatives of peasant farmers, fisher folk, nomads, pastoralists, urban farmers, workers in their diversity, and paying attention to the changing nature of work, contest elitist and privatized ideas of who has a right to the city, who has a right to the land, who has a right to be human. It is a call to work across movements. It is a call to build and the possibilities of communities of resistance, different groups across the globe, people connected together, not by essentialist and simplistic notions of their struggles or cultural or biological alliances, but rather connected by their political links that they choose to make about their lives and their struggles. That I say that as I sit in Nairobi, that my struggle is connected to the struggle of the people in Gaza. It is connected to the struggle of Mozambicans resisting the extractive force of Total or Shell. It needs a solidarity with Latin America that continues to resist 500 years of the legacies of colonialism. And we must rethink our relationships with one another. This is perhaps the most central thing when I think about my own politics, what colonialism has robbed us, what the fossil fuel industries have robbed us. The idea of being human, as Dipti has said, the idea of Ubuntu, the idea that we are whole, what capitalism has done, what colonialism has done to break us completely, that the idea of being human the idea that I am because you are, the idea that solidarity, as Robin Kelly says, is not a marketplace exchange. It's not that I do for you because you did for me, but that solidarity is an idea, the very foundation of our humanity. And I do hope that as we speak about our politics of transition, as we speak about the possibilities of the future, that we, we continue to build a world and to work as if, you know, that our humanity is the most important thing, that the earth and nature, which we are part of, are not merely things, are not actually merely things to be ex exploited and desecrated. We who believe in freedom must resist. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ruth. What a fabulous, um, powerful, message from you. Uh, we deeply appreciate you taking the time to share your wisdom and knowledge with us. Um, that was really, really, really meaningful. And, um, you know, just also to highlight before I hand the floor over to our next speaker, how um, imperative it is that we have the systemic analysis and see that uh, the interlocking systems of oppression, of patriarchy, colonization, racism, and capitalism, and that these systems of oppression are so deeply embedded in our everyday life that we continue and must continue to radicalize our movements into a new formation where we are completely working as a grassroots movement that has our own space to operate in, our own space of liberation, our own space of decolonization to generate the path forward. And I thank you so much, Ruth, for really highlighting those points for us. And now we're going to hand the floor to Mitzi Janelle Tan. Um, and please go ahead and share her presentation. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Mitzi Janelle Tan. I'm a full-time youth climate justice activist based in the Philippines, and I am guided by the principles of anti-imperialism, system change, collective action, and joy and love. I'm also on the steering committee of the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty and the Youth Climate Justice Fund and an organized Red Fridays for Future International in MAPA, which is most affected people in areas. Last year at COP28 in Dubai, we saw a historical victory, I would say several, that was only possible because of decades of lobbying, activist work, protest, campaigning by civil society and by the people, and by the people most vulnerable to the climate crisis. And so we saw, finally, the Loss and Damage Finance Fund was operationalized although the money that was coming in and has been pledged is nowhere near enough. And some countries like the U.S. pledged an embarrassingly low amount, especially considering how much money they invest in war and conflict and the genocide in Palestine. We also saw 
um, for the first time ever, a day that focused on peace or anti-war and anti-conflict. Um, and so now we're seeing that even the COP systems are finally hearing what civil society have been saying for years that we cannot divorce the issues of war and conflict from the climate crisis because they fuel one another. And we also saw for the first time ever in 28 years, the one of the main drivers behind the climate crisis, the fossil fuels, finally in the final COP text. And so it is a bit disappointing that it took 28 years for this to happen, especially because we've known for a very long time now that the fossil fuel industry is one of the main causes and drivers of the climate crisis. Um, but it is also, again, not perfect because there are many um, loopholes and false solutions that come right under the, the line of the fossil fuel um, mention. And so now more than ever, we need to be vigilant. We need to keep campaigning. We need to be, keep bringing people on board to ensure that we actually have the end of the fossil fuel era. But this is all good news because that means that we're stepping towards an, a better direction. And something that excites me and a lot of young people I know is the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty, which will be a complementary to the Paris Agreement, a way that we can actually ensure that the, as the Paris Agreement lays down the goals, the Fossil Fuel Treaty says how we're doing it, how we're going to have that just transition, how we're going to have that non-proliferation or that stopping of existing fossil fuel industries, and how we're going to phase out existing ones, all again in a global and just way. And 12 countries have now signed on to the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty, with Colombia being the latest and the majority being led by the Pacific Islands that have been such leaders in climate action over the years. And it is so promising and so exciting to see that that will go and continue to push forward alongside the UNF Triple T processes. Um, and so we will, I, I really, really feel and believe that we will start seeing the end of the fossil fuel era um, this year. Thank you so much, uh, Mitzi, for that um, good work that you're doing. Um, she mentioned the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty, and we're going to be having Zipporah Berman, who is the chair of the Fossil Fuel Treaty, joining us on the second panel. And so we're really excited to uplift the treaty um, as uh, another example of a mechanism of how we can phase out fossil fuels uh, with a, a global agreement. Um, so uh, we're, we're really excited to have Mitzi with us and also uh, to have Zippor with us shortly. And uh, we're now going to thank all of our speakers. Uh, we ran out of time for the discussion part, but it was so good to hear from all of you um, and, and really give you the chance to, to share your ideas, your knowledge and your wisdom with us. So I want to thank all of you. Uh, all, of, all of the speakers are dear colleagues of mine and I look forward to the year ahead with you and all that we're going to do. It's very difficult times as we've all expressed, but we are in solidarity together. We are lifting each other up. And that is what I believe in. I believe in us collecting together and the collective power of our movements um, are going to be what takes us through this small uh, window that we're in right now into the world that we're working so hard to birth um, out of this, this time of great catastrophe. So thank you all for the visions, the struggles, the work, the solutions you're offering and have a wonderful International Women's Day. Thank you so much. Solidarity with all of you. And um, we're now gonna switch to our next panel, but before we do, we wanted to share with all of you um, the release of our new video that is to uplift so many women in the movement and to share with you what some of those women are doing in action. And it's called Women Ending the Era of Fossil Fuels and Building a Just Transition. And we're gonna go ahead and share that video as we move into our second panel. Thank you. How will the future generation look back on us? Are they gonna say that we were the healers? We were the warriors that stood up for them so that they may live. In the 
this time of colliding crises and failing infrastructures, worsening climate disasters, I do believe we have a time to act to ensure a fast, fair, and equitable phase out and ensure a planet for current and future generations. A recent report by the UN Environment Program found that governments still plan to produce more than double the amount of fossil fuels in 2030 than what would be consistent with limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees. Since the signing of the Paris Agreement, the world's 60 largest private banks have provided $5.5 trillion in financing to the fossil fuel industry. We cannot continue with these disastrous numbers. The fossil fuel industry has hurt us for far too long both in the terms of emissions, but also causing a lot of wars and militarization. And when we talk about the impacts of oil and gas and why we need a phase out of oil and gas all across the globe is because this is not just about the reduction of emissions at source. This is also about the reductions of the harms and the violence indigenous peoples have felt on our lands and our bodies and our communities. It's crystal clear. We now need, we need a concrete, binding plan to end the expansion of new coal, oil and gas projects and manage a transition away from fossil fuels. Nation states are now calling for a fossil fuel treaty, an equitable and wind down plan for how to manage the wind down in a way that leaves no country or community behind. King, King. mulheres precisamos continuar avançando juntas e juntas estamos aqui também para apresentar soluções whether it's on the front lines of resistance to fossil fuels protecting and replanting forests creating food sovereignty networks or advocating for transformative climate policies women are leading the way it is code red for humanity and we're drawing a red line to say no more to sacrifice people and no more to sacrifice zones we need to decolonize these spaces because like if the planet is still alive it's because we the women are taking care of our lands the message is quite clear feminists frontline activists frontline women indigenous people have long had the solutions are advocating for these year in year out and it is time we heed their leadership because we have long run out of time e viemos fazer um clamor não há possibilidade de barrar as mudanças climáticas sem considerar os territórios como solução número um. Pela terra, pelas águas, pela floresta de pé, não podemos derramar sangue indígena no chão. We're enacting things in the Ponca territory like the rights of nature because we know that we as human beings are not separate from nature. But at this moment, we are nature protecting itself. So just such an uplifting video to see all that incredible work and all of those women working so hard uh, for this fossil fuel phase out. So I'm going to uh, introduce our next panelist in a moment, um, but I wanted just to cue it up by sharing a few of the reports that we um, have been working on over the last six months or so. Um, and they're really pertinent to, to this conversation we're having today. One is called Examining the Links Between Care and Climate Change, Prioritizing Care Work Can Unlock a Just Transition for All. And it demonstrates how investments in high quality care jobs can help mitigate the worst impacts of the climate crisis, increase funding for public infrastructure, and support economies within a just transition framework. And care, this care economy, 
is key to building resilient and equitable economies. And the report offers four case studies um, that really show how the care economy works. And the report also provides a list of recommendations for policymakers aiming to facilitate the development of transition policies that prioritize the care economy and women's leadership. And so uh, this is on our website, and I just wanted to make that available to everyone. And also the other uh, report I wanted to share that as we make demands for a fast, fair, and funded fossil fuel phase out, which you hear many of us saying, because um, as Dipti pointed out, and, and many of us um, at the last COP negotiations kept talking about, there has to be funding so that this phase out can happen equitably. Um, so this is this is what we mean when we say fast, fair, and funded. Uh, we also know that it's essential to make clear that there are false solutions to the climate crisis, including dangerous or unproven techno fixes, carbon offset schemes that don't work, net zero pledges that delay immediate action, amongst many others. And so I wanted to share this other report also on our website. Um, it's a policy analysis called the need for real zero, not net zero, shifting from false solutions to real solutions and a just transition. And it details all of these vital topics of the false solutions versus what we really need to see for an immediate, fast, fair, and funded phase out. And um, with that, I want to welcome our next set of speakers. Um, maybe my team could let me know if Pierre has joined us or not. Um, but Pior Tembe is from uh, is the Secretary of Indigenous Peoples in the PAR state of Brazil. Um, and then we'll be hearing from Zabora Berman. She is the chair of the Fossil Fuel Nonproliferation Treaty from Canada. Uh, then we'll be hearing from Nima Namadamu, who is the founder and executive director of Hero Women Rising. And we're very honored to have her as our weekend coordinator in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And she is from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, and then we will be hearing from Tammy Greer of the Huma Nation. She's Associate Professor and Director for the Center for American Indian Research and Studies at Southern Mississippi, Southern Mississippi. And also we're very honored to have her as a weekend program lead uh, for our project in the Gulf South, which she'll be talking to you about. And she is from Turtle Island, USA. So um, with that, I'd like to know if Pierre is here. And if not, yeah. then we'll go to Tammy. Oh, excuse me. Um, we will hear from Zipporah. Great, yeah, um, we're still getting Pierre online, so let's go with Zipporah. Okay, Thanks. great, thanks for letting me know. Zipporah, you have the floor, and thank you so much for being with us on International Women's Day. Thank you so much, Osprey. It's so amazing to be with you all today and, and to hear all the stories and the fierce, the fierce love that everyone is acting with uh, around the world. Um, I wanted to take a, a couple of moments to introduce those of you who, who don't know about the Fossil Fuel Treaty uh, to, to the idea of the Fossil Fuel Treaty and the Fossil Fuel Treaty movement around the world and how much progress we've made in such a short time, as Osprey knows really well because I contacted her when we first started pulling it together three years ago. We started in COVID. Um, with this big, bold idea to create a new global movement where we're all acting together and calling on our governments to put in place a new solution, which is commensurate with the scale of the problem. A lot of our work for many years was virtual and online. We had very few resources, but even, even though that was true, the movement lit like fire around the planet. We're now active. Um, in over 40 countries, active fossil fuel treaty campaigns around the world. We have over 3,000 organizations that have endorsed from over 100 countries around the world. It's been pretty exciting. But let me take a moment to share my screen and back up so we all um, are coming from the same place and understand what it is and what we're trying to do together. Okay. Osprey, can you see just the one yes. slide? Everything's good, yes. Great, thank you. So the fossil fuel treaty, uh, the idea for the treaty starts here with an understanding that although we've all been working for now 30 years and many more to reduce um, uh, emissions uh, from fossil fuels and our governments have been negotiating uh, who gets to pollute and how much, we haven't been reaching any agreements or even trying to reach agreements on who gets to produce what fossil fuels and how much. 
So, you know, an economist would say it's like we're trying to cut with one half of the scissors. We're reducing demand, um, you know, the increase of heat pumps and renewable energy and 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 um, uh, electric vehicles around the world. We're reaching agreements on on reducing emissions. And yet we're just producing more and more and more fossil fuels every day. Why does that matter? It matters because what we build today will be what we use tomorrow. And we can't afford to keep using polluting fossil fuels tomorrow. And we don't need to because cleaner and safer solutions that are distributed, that put power in every sense of the word into the hands of more people and more women around the world are now available to us and we're not using them. Why aren't we using them? Why do we continue to grow fossil fuel production? Because we don't have the right rules in place and this is the most powerful industry in the world. They're holding our politics hostage and even while countries agree to reduce emissions, they're still approving new fossil fuel projects, billions of dollars of new fossil fuel projects approved this year alone. This graph shows you from the UN production report that we're on track to produce 110% more oil, gas, and coal between now and 2030 than we can ever burn and stay below 1.5 degrees. So the majority of the world's, or a lot of the world's financial, political capital, intellectual capital is going to dig up stuff that we know is killing us and we also know we can't use. So we already have enough. We already have enough coal, coal, oil and gas in existing projects that if we burned it, it would take us well beyond 1.5 degrees and even two degrees. You know, climate policy and climate agreements are complicated, but what's not complicated is that 86% of the emissions trapped in our atmosphere today that are smothering the planet, creating this blanket that is smothering the planet and killing people every day. 86% of those emissions come from three things, oil, gas, and coal. We know what's causing it, but because of the influence of the fossil fuel industry, our negotiations, our policy has been warped to allow them to continue to make billions of dollars in profits and expand their products every day even though we have cleaner and safer solutions to use. Many people don't realize that the Paris Agreement doesn't even mention the words fossil fuels or oil, gas, or coal. And that's in large part because of the power of the fossil fuel industry. If you look at the documents that are now being released in court cases around the world, what you see is they had a plan. And their plan was to make us feel guilty for our use of fossil fuels and to make sure that negotiations focused on emissions, focused on carbon counting, focused on carbon credits and offsets and tortured carbon math without actually constraining the production of their products. But that has ended with the growth of the fossil fuel movement around the world, starting from indigenous nations and people and their frontline communities opposing projects one by one but we know we can't afford to just oppose projects one by one. We don't have time because today with what's happening in our world, every ton of carbon matters and every ton of carbon that we save from going into the atmosphere is going to save lives. So we need to stop those new fossil fuel projects, those new LNG projects, oil drilling in the heart of the Amazon, more oil drilling in Nigeria, but we need to force our governments to cooperate because we need to not just stop one or two of those projects, we need to stop expansion all over the planet. And that's what the science says. That's what the International Energy Agency says. That's what our scientific reports say. No new projects fit under a goal of 1.5. So the fossil fuel treaty is designed with three pillars in mind. A just transition. How do we help countries coordinate and, and create new rules of global governance in order to fast track a just transition? How do we make new rules so we ensure that we're not just um, going out of the pan and into the fire? There should be no-go zones agreed to around the world on where critical minerals can be found. There should be rules around human rights and mining. There should be uh, support for countries so they're not forced to drill for new oil just to feed their debt. So this, these are the areas that were being looked at under the third pillar, under the just transition pillar of the treaty. We need to stop expanding the problem. People keep talking about a transition, but it's not a transition if they're building more and new fossil fuel projects. 
We need to stop expansion and we need new rules to do that. And we need a fair phase out. Who gets to produce what fossil fuels and how much in this time of a limited global carbon budget should be based on fairness and equity and not left up to the markets because we know there's no justice embedded in the marketplace. There are five um, uh, um, stages of creating a new treaty. And over the past three years, we have built a strong, powerful global movement. And now we have 12 nation states that have endorsed the call for a treaty and are creating the block of nations and the negotiating mandate to start to create multilateral processes and begin to negotiate a treaty. We even have two countries that are fossil fuel producers, Colombia and Timor-Leste. Colombia is the fifth largest coal exporter in the world, and they have joined the call for a fossil fuel treaty because what they clearly understand is that every day, countries who are expanding fossil fuel production make the problem worse, but they can't stop expanding unless there is new international coordination on debt, on finance to support countries in the global south. So the movement has grown over the past three years. We have over 3,000 scientists and academics that have endorsed the call, 800 parliamentarians, 600,000 individuals around the world. Let's make it a million uh, this year. We have 105 cities and subnational governments that have endorsed the Fossil Fuel Treaty, including California, one of the largest economies in the world, nine indigenous nations and growing every day and over 2,000 civil society organizations in, in, in over 100 countries. We're building the evidence case and foundation to support you in this work against fossil fuels. I hope you will go to fossilfueltreaty.org and see some of the many reports, including the report that looks at how fossil fuel expansion threatens all 17 sustainable development goals, including the issue, including support for women and gender. The Fossil Fuel Treaty is now starting to get support and media around the world. We had over 6,000 articles around the world talking about the Fossil Fuel Treaty in the last year alone. We have 101 Nobel laureates who have, enjoyed, who have joined the call, 420 faith institutions from around the world, the World Health Organization, a UN body, because they know that fossil fuels are one of the greatest causes of premature death in the world, causing over 5 million deaths last year just from air pollution alone. The European Parliament has supported the Fossil Fuel Treaty, youth activists from around the world, and we now have an active youth caucus at the Fossil Fuel Treaty movement, parliamentarians, the state of California, and groups from all over the world. So what can you do? Join us, make it your own. No one owns the idea of a fossil fuel treaty and our global secretariat is there to support you in, 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 in making this campaign land in a way in your country in whatever way works for you. Um, so I hope that you will join the fossil fuel treaty campaign because we all know what we're facing today and how it gets worse every single day. And together, Together, we're so much more powerful than apart. Some say that it's uh, the idea is too big, that it's too bold, that we can't afford the time to negotiate a new treaty. But I think what we all know here is that we can't afford more of the, more of the same. And the fossil fuel industry, an industry that is making $2.8 billion in profits every single day for the last 50 years, the fossil fuel industry has taken away our imagination and our creativity. It's been holding us hostage. And together, we can think about a different world, a world in which power is shared, a world in which women and children are empowered and safe and aren't dying from the oil spills and the air pollution and the asthma and the heat. A world in which we ensure that fairness and equity is at the core of new international agreements where we know that we're standing together, together with our sisters on the front line, together with people all over the world who are standing up against this industry and calling on our governments to have the imagination, the creativity, and the courage to do something bold. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zipporah. And um, it's, it's such a powerful vision. I wanna thank you so much for your leadership. And it does take a lot of courage and it also takes a lot of confidence to stand up 
in this space when people, um, as you you uh, alluded to in your comments, um, can be telling us that our ideas, our visions are too bold, that we should, you know, listen to politics, look at the reality of what's really going on in our world, and to conform to these old systems. And this is exactly why, you know, at the beginning of, of our conversation today, we talked about uh, that this is a time where there are so many interlocking crises and fractures in our system. This is exactly the time for bold ideas. This is exactly when we need to change our trajectory. And so um, I'm really excited about the treaty. I'm really honored to be on the steering committee and you know, to be sure we are going to be standing with this campaign until we see the end of fossil fuels. Uh, so thank you for your, your work. Um, and I'd like to now move to our next speaker um, who I'm very excited to introduce. Um, and you know, this panel is also to talk about some of what the just transition looks like. What are we actually calling forward? What are our visions and new ways of doing things? And um, I'm so thrilled to have Nima Namadamu with us. She's the founder and executive director of Here Women Rising, as mentioned, and also our coordinator in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And we're gonna show a, a, a little video here just to get everybody familiar with her work. And then we will hear from Nima on International Women's Day. Go ahead. When I come back here after 25 years, I really I was shocked. When I was a little girl, the forest was here. And when I was here, I see no more trees. Idea was how again people can bring life back. As the climate crisis increases, scientists are telling us that one of the most important things that we can do is to protect forests and biodiversity. The Congo Basin is one of the largest and most important forests of the world, only second to the Amazon in terms of size. And there, we are reforesting damaged lands, lands that due to extractive industries, agricultural business, have been completely turned into deserts. We have now 500 women, we are planting those trees. And if when you're planting trees, you are on those trees and you are on, on the land. That is not usual on our culture, women to have some property, some ownership. That gives us really confidence. Seventy-five percent of the trees are going to rewilding the forest. Some of them now are 20 feet tall, and we're quickly seeing the forest begin to regenerate. And 25 percent are for human use, so that we can ensure that we're protecting the 1.6 million acres of old growth forest. This is where their food comes from, where their medicines come from, where the things they need for their homes come from, their pharmacy. Women, they are now protecting environment with trees, women of Itombe forest, natural forest from DRC. We are trying to protect our environment. We're now protecting 1.6 million acres of old growth forest over the years as we reforest in the Congo Basin. During the COVID-19 pandemic, there was a real need to develop more food sovereignty and food security. So now not only in the nurseries that we have are we planting sapling trees, but also lots of food for the local communities. Vegetables we did really help so much. People to have vegetables to fight with malnutrition. And the women are just so proud to not only be planting trees and healing their damaged homelands, but also protecting this old growth forest for all of us for doing their part 
in mitigating the climate crisis. So for all of these things, it's a very comprehensive project that's lifting up women, lifting up indigenous peoples and their traditional ways of life, protecting old growth forest and reforesting damaged lands. All of these forests will become soon big one. And we want to really to have again, bring new oxygen, winds will be stopping winds and it's really very, very, very important. Trees, they are life. And with that, I welcome my dear sister, Nima from the DR oh, Congo. Welcome, thank you. Thank you, thank you. I really, let's begin. Good afternoon, here is a, a, nine and they have almost a 10 at night. Yes. Wow. Well, thank you for I joining wanted, us in your evening. <laughs> yes, I wanted to wish everyone, every woman, indigenous women, other women's happy Women's Day, International Women's Day. You can be white, black, or terrible. Happy International Women's Day. This day is really giving us doing like a looking on a mirror to see wherever we already did. And I enjoyed to see the video about my dear sister who are in the village, who are working. And today my purpose is to talk. First of all, my name is Nema Namadamu. I'm from DRC Congo, where some people who doesn't know Congo, Congo is in the middle Africa. It's the second large country in Africa. And also is the second rainforest after Amazon forest. That is the Congo. And this third things we have is good, but is bad also. We have those minerals, those country, they are looking for maybe transition to not to use electrical cars. Those minerals, they are from Congo. And now we are really, really fighting to let is why the conflict never finish in DRC because the colonizing mind and the people during second, uh, when the colonizer come and the King Leopold did, did the timing was uh, now was a new age was coming the cars, the material for making tires was from DRC Congo. And that time they killed half population whole country was 10 million people died that timing. And is that again, second time is it like, just the beginning again of conflict, of capitalism, of colonized mind, of economics, driving people to kill all these people, all these indigenous people, people who live in the communities because they wanted those minerals to make electrical cars, to make airplanes, to make guns, to make bombs all those to make funds, computer, those material, they are from Congo, almost all, but Congo is that resources, big resources. We don't know why every age when people change, they come Congo again. That is really where we are just now. Let me talk about a little bit about women leadership and climate change. The women of DRC, um, uh, they are always front line to do planting trees. Planting trees during COVID uh, crisis, we was happening, we didn't have a really food. We didn't have a way to transportation for food because we live in a very remote area and almost uh, ST Congo population now living on displacement camp, IDP camp. And now we was having like, we don't have food. And every day we don't have a fridge. We live in naturally. We go to, uh, to harvest something on a plantation and you come, you cook fresh food, organic food. We don't have a fridge. We don't have electricity. We cook 
natural food and we cook it through the the let me see we cook naturally we don't have like a stove you go to open do machine no you see in the video the fire women cooking and everything is the women who do they cook they look uh, food they go to do harvest the different food and when we have a crisis is really like I am a daughter of Kong, Weekend Congo, I asked my dear sister, we've been working with Osprey now eight years. We are really become, we are good uh, partners, we are friends, we are sisters. It's where we work together. And the women work by hand, doing the planting trees. And now when we got to see the to, to, to do food, was really amazing. We did uh, soya beans, sorgo, tomato, vegetables, different vegetables. And we, we did fighting with people. We did uh, 16 kitchen in the, the different villages where villages displacement people who lives in like a camp around the UN peacekeeper. And those people really they will enjoy how women all together, these planting trees, looking for the planting have a seed to plant a food to go together all women is like a mechanism is like kind of people together from women from all community planting food doing um grander together that make people back together that is the leadership women have i don't want me to go to scientifically but when we have these women together from a different, different tribe, they have a conversation and say, okay, if you have some potato and I have peas, we can exchange. That make women and the community together. And the people was living 400 years ago together. And right now it's becoming conflict between the community. It never exists. But right now, because of those digging, digging for looking minerals, different minerals, it's not never stop in our area because women still have no voice. And where I invite you guys, please join Hero Women Rising to fight, to be on the front line, to plant the trees, to fight about climate change. And this is really where it's just Sometimes I'm thinking it's just the beginning, it's just the beginning. When we have again food, the people, uh, kids at school have porridge. That's making me smiling again. And today we really am honored to ex explain little analyzing how we can find the peace when women meet on the ground, planting trees, going same uh, area, planting trees, different community that bring peace. Last time I was talking about how now we can have every one village planting one space, another village planting another space. And when they meet on the market, they exchange without using money, without having to go so far and everyone have fresh food. That is what we are doing and how you see women nourishing community, kid, family, nations, and everyone who can talk, who can speak, no one who can speak in hunger. That is the women leadership. Everyone needed the food. Everyone needed to be alive. And when we're planting also trees, I want the Western countries to know it's not only by our benefit, is benefits for our planet. And we have only one planet. We can be white, you can be rich or poor, or whatever you are and your, your position you have, we need to protect our environment. We need to protect this planet. We are not going to have another one. And I think whole partnership or women who lives in this so hard to work in this patriarchal system 
for this country who are especially in Africa. Really, we are so tired with this mind colonizing. Is it continuing? It never stops. They say people have independence, but we never get independence. Everything, those Western countries, they are looking like a commissioner, those leaders who cannot take any action. We organization, civil society organization, we try to make really, and we work so hard, sacrifice, but our leader, we need Western countries give us real freedom, give us little sum, we can make decision for ourselves. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nima, for your really powerful comments. And just, it's such a joy to have you as a partner um, and a dear sister and friend. Thank you for your incredible work and your powerful comments about how colonization needs to end and the vision that you're holding. I so deeply appreciate that. Thank you so much for joining us on International Women's Day and also the carrying the voice of all of uh, the communities that you work with. Um, you know, and, and we're, we're sharing your information here in the chat. And so I just wanted to thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now we are going to hear from Tammy Greer from the Human Nation. Tammy, you have the floor. Okay, sorry, you, 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 you asking me? No, Tammy, we're trying to get Tammy on. Thank you, thank you so much, Nima. Thank you, okay. Nima. Tammy, go ahead. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen real quick. We have stories in our Southeastern tribes about how the human ones were created out of clay. Some people um, say I, we're not seeing your screen. If you were trying to share a screen, we're, we're not seeing it yet. Thanks, Tammy. Let's see. Share screen. There, try that. No, we're not seeing it. Maybe uh, Ashley or Catherine, could you uh, help Tammy with that? Is that it? Nope. Hmm. I don't know then. I'm seeing it, that's for sure. Um, I wonder if you could send it along to um, our team and maybe they could share your slides for you. That's one idea. Okay, hang on. Let me see. Let's see. Let's see. Well, um, I can't because it's too big of a file. The, the slides ah. are so ginormous that I can't do it, but maybe I can just speak to you then. Okay. Okay. So we have stories in our Southeastern tribes about how the human ones were created out of clay. And I had a nice picture of somebody sitting in a, a cave with clay around them, but they were only created after most all the other beings were already here. So if you think about that, it was into wild spaces that we emerged as little brothers and sisters, much younger siblings of all of our relatives on this earth. So the story goes that when the other beings saw the newly created human ones, they noticed our pitifulness, think on that, and having compassion for our lack, the other beings agreed to make sacrifices, sometimes even sacrificing their own lives. Think about even plants. When you pull them up, that's the root. That's their life. So that we, the human ones, could survive. So, for example, palmetto fronds were sacrificed to shelter the human ones who didn't have a thick skin. They didn't have thick fur to shelter themselves. The standing ones who produce fruit drop their fruit to the ground to provide food and drink and dyes and pigments for the human ones who didn't have those long arms and those climbing claws and the ability really to forge high in the trees for others or for themselves. The standing ones, my other thing, the pokey ones provided their guard hair. We have people who have like guard hair up on top of their heads 
and their warriors. And the pokey ones, the porcupines provided guard hair so that we could look fierce. You've probably seen that in pictures before of natives dancing. The flying ones gave their feathers so that the human ones could fan themselves and also warm themselves. Hickory trees provided hardwood for stickball sticks, rabbit sticks, and bows. Ivy on the ground provided a nice soft spot to sit. Swamp cane down here in the southeast, we have swamp cane, longleaf pine, palmetto, and we use them as basket materials so that the human ones could carry all of what they needed, and they needed a lot. And many of our plant relatives gave bark, nuts, fruits, and flowers to the human ones who didn't have as beautiful colorings as the other animals and plants. <coughs> so they provided for us to decorate ourselves. These relatives of ours in their wall spaces provided everything we needed to survive and thrive. And we had trade networks along the rivers and that were bison paths so that we moved these things from the top of the Americas all the way to the bottom of South America. We have our Yopan holly and left-handed whelk shell cups that move from the Southeast all the way up to the top of the Americas. In this story, the same story, the human ones who were so well cared for by the other beings begin to get arrogant. In their cleverness, they came to believe themselves superior to the winged ones, the creepy crawly, the swimming ones, the four-legged, even the standing ones. Think about a three-year-old, the arrogance. We forgot our place as newcomers who needed to watch and learn from our elders. We forgot that all of life is connected one with another. We forgot that we were dependent one on another for survival. In our youthful arrogance, we forgot that it is us who needs to learn from these wild spaces, from these wild places and they were occupied by our plant and animal brothers and sisters, the very ones who made sacrifices for us and for our ancestors and allowed them to survive and thrive for thousands of years. It was in our ignorance and youthful folly that our paradigm of domination emerged. And so we drained our swamps, planted invasives, polluted our oceans, dammed our rivers, blew up our mountaintops and drilled into and extracted out of the very veins and arteries of our own mother, the earth. And so what we're hearing today is that we are in precarious times. We human beings and our plant and animal relatives are all in this together. The seas are rising, floods and hurricanes in our coastal areas are already more frequent. They're more severe, they're more devastating, and the way forward is becoming more difficult to discern. But as indigenous peoples, we've been here before. Our ancestors in the recent past and yours, maybe further back, have experienced devastating losses from diseases, migrations, famines, fires, genocides. In our short history of human beings on this earth, we've had major things happen. This paradigm of domination has moved us out of relationship with other beings on the earth. But there is another paradigm. Our indigenous medicinal teachings offer us another paradigm. Our teachings in this story and also in the medicine wheel speak about a co-creation paradigm where we embrace wild spaces and create our environments within them and among them, and we tend them just as they tend us. And we work together to keep the wheel, our world, in balance. Medicine will teachings tell us that there are four aspects to our world, fire and earth and air and water. And when we focus on just one of those for resources, like extraction, processes that place a heavy burden on our earth, medicine will teachings say that that makes us out of balance and there are consequences for that. The teachings go on to say that there are four aspects to ourselves, spirit, emotion, body, and mind. And when we focus too much on one aspect, like our mental capacity, thinking we are so clever 
and being able to figure out how to build the tallest building, dig the deepest hole, blow up the biggest mountain. When we fancy our cleverness and forget to consider the why of what we're doing, the reason human beings are here on this earth, our spiritual aspect or the how of what we're doing and how that affects other beings who support us, our social emotional aspect, or when we ignore what we are building, digging or blowing up and how that affects our body, our health, well, then again, we're out of balance and there are consequences for that. The medicine will teachings say that it's our job to restore that balance in the world and in ourselves, restoring these wild spaces, tending them, learning from them, from our elders, the trees, the bears, the mountain lions, the worms. That's part of the restoration of balance. These wild beings know how to live in balance. And so we have a group of indigenous folks working with We Can, who are building greenhouses, gardens, wild spaces, and food forests all along our traditional trade routes so that we can help one another with this sacred task of reestablishing ourselves in this world in such a way that we are in right relation with other beings, with ourselves and with one another. We are growing out seeds from our gardens to give or trade or sell in order to support other gardens, other yards and other wild spaces. Food sovereignty is important to tribal folks and our plants are an important part of that. These plants still have a lot to teach us. I learn lessons about boundaries every time I'm poked by my Spanish dagger. I've bled out that lesson. I learn how to give an unbelievable measure without discrimination from Palmetto sharing her thousands of seeds with whomever walks by and wants to collect them. And we can all learn like that if we just listen. But also we need to embrace a different paradigm Bringing back wild places are an important part of that paradigm shift because what we're doing is obviously not sustainable. We can't live at the end of the earth. We live in our communities literally at the end of the earth, and we can't do it all by ourselves without the others. We need our wild brothers and sisters. We need their help in restoring what's been taken from the land, like the trees and the plants that form protection from floods, both for themselves and also for us. Protection from the damaging winds of hurricanes, protection from heat and the ability to reverse this warming of our world. And we need their help in restoring what we have taken from ourselves, what we've taken from all beings, that connection with what sustains us, the shade, our food, our medicine, our furniture, our breath. We need these places that are tended and wild, because it's dangerous to be so out of relationship with one another, with other beings, and with our earth, really with our very own selves. So out of relation that a swamp is scary and concrete is natural. We need wildness because we're wild beings born into wildness, wildly tended. And through lessons of reciprocity, we can begin again to tend what is wild around us. And we need you to help us with this most sacred of tasks. And thank you. Thank you so much, Tammy. Um, really beautiful to hear your words of wisdom and also to help us um, be in the narrative that you shared so well around our relationship with Mother Earth and life and the plant and animal beings that we share this earth with and to really learn from indigenous knowledge about reciprocity and practice reciprocity. So thank you for uh, bringing us um, that knowledge and also for the beautiful work you do um, in the Gulf South. Tammy's an amazing, amazing uh, indigenous leader, farmer um, who you know has been teaching for years and tending the land for years and years. So thank you for that. Um, and with that, I wanted to also let uh, people know that Pierre, um, who is, uh, uh, from Brazil was called into her territories. Um, I, we just got the message uh, with some urgent matters. So I'm very sorry she's not going to be able to join us today, but she sends her greetings for International Women's Day. Um, and we will send her good thoughts for her, her urgent activities. Um, and with that, I wanted just to thank all of the panelists for joining us. We're, we're getting to the top of the hour here. So we're going to go ahead and close out. I wanted to thank uh, 
Zipporah, Nima, Tammy for your really brilliant presentations and words, um, and that we can all feel our collective energy together. That's why we wanted to meet today on International Women's Day to really hear from one another, um, invite our international audience to learn from all of you and to get involved. These are so many wonderful things to learn about. Let's roll up our sleeves and engage. Um, and also to say that, you know, one of the reasons we are having this broad ranging conversation with the first and second panel is that we really believe that it's important to have short term goals, the immediate fires that we have to put out, you know, we're fighting to stop pipelines, we're fighting to, pr to protect forests. We're doing all of this work that must be done. You know, there is a crisis in Gaza, we have to act now. And at the same time, you can hear from a lot of our the wisdom from the women who've spoken today, this need for also these larger visions of systemic change. And you all spoke to that so beautifully about the large movements that we're building, the need to stop colonization, the need to change the patriarchal uh, construct, the need to change our economic systems. And um, all of this is key to the heart of International Women's Day and those that have carried uh, the torch of liberation before us that has gone on for generation after generation. And we're now holding that torch and we have our struggles and our solutions that we're offering to this ongoing story of getting humans to be good humans, to be you know, living here in a reciprocal way, a life enhancing way with nature and each other. And that's a great task of our time. Um, so with that, I want to thank all of our presenters. Thank you for the beautiful work you're doing and everyone who listened in today. Uh, let's, let's carry on together and be together. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Happy International Women's Day. <laughs>